Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and welcome back for part 4 of Cenozoic Life History. So now we're going to spend a few slides looking at giant land dwelling mammals and in particular the elephants. So the elephants are part of the order Proboscidea and they are amongst the largest land mammals ever. Now the largest example of a modern elephant was 12 tons in weight and about 4.2 meters high at the shoulder. And so this means it would have been approaching the size of the hornless rhinoceros that we saw a couple of slides ago. It would also mean it would have been about the same size as a woolly mammoth. Now along with their size of course the other distinguishing features that the elephants possess is their long snout which is sometimes referred to as its proboscis or trunk and of course its tusks. Now, the earliest member of the order is the 100 to 200 kilogram Moetherium, and this first appears in the Eocene. And it has, a f it has few distinct characteristics which make it look like an elephant, and it was probably actually aquatic or semi-aquatic in its preferred habitat. Now, the proboscis first appears with an organism called the Paleomastodon at the eocene oligocene boundary. So as we transition into the Oligocene, the order Proboscidea begins to show the following trends. So we see a shift towards larger body sizes, a shift towards longer proboscises, and a shift towards larger tusks. So the tusks are actually in sizes, which means they're technically teeth. So the question then becomes is, well, why do we have these changes taking place? Now, the shift to a larger body size is rather easily explained, and it's something we've already discussed when we've looked at earlier animals. And it's all because we have this dying back of these large forested areas as we transition from the Oligocene into the Miocene. So if you remember, during the Paleocene, the Eocene, and the early Oligocene, the climate is quite nice, and we have extensive forests. By the time we're moving into the Oligocene and the Miocene, we see the, we see the climate getting a little bit harsher, and we see these forests beginning to die back, and they're replaced by grassland, where we have lots of open space, mostly covered in grass, and a few scattered trees spread here and there. Now, of course, this means that animals like the uh, proboscidea are now essentially exposed, and so they'll be e easier to spot by predators, and they'll be more easily attacked. And so one of the defences against being attacked is, of course, to evolve to become larger. And this is exactly what the order proboscidea does. Now, in terms of the increasing length of the proboscis, this is actually due to a change in eating habits. Now, if we look at the earlier members, we can see that they didn't have a proboscis, or the proboscis they had was very, very short. And so this means they would only have been able to eat whatever they could get their mouth to. And so this means they would sometimes have been limited in their food sources, and in some, on some occasions they may have actually had to consume plant matter that may not have been you know, advantageous to them. It might have actually taken more energy to eat and digest than they actually got from it. Now, by having a larger proboscis, what it actually means is, is you can be more selective. You can actually reach up, grab a branch, pull it down, and that allows you to actually bring the best plant material to you. So you can be selective in your eating and get the best material. It also means you can be so selective that you can actually pick individual fruits from a tree. And so this means you don't have to, you know, eat the energy poor leaves. Instead, you can eat the energy rich fruits, which will obviously be an evolutionary advantage to you. So the growth of the proboscis and the ability to bring food to the mouth is a great evolutionary step forward for the group proboscidea. Now, in terms of the large tusks, we can see that these begin to develop towards the, well, towards the modern day, so from about the Pliocene onwards into the Pleistocene. Now, tusks are both defensive structures, so they're there to essentially, you know, ward off predators, but they also have some uses, in particular for the mammoths and the mastodons. So these were living in areas which were covered by a tundra-like assemblage of plants. These were plants that were very, very low to the ground. There wasn't much tree cover. So in order to you know, get the best possible food, what these animals had to do is they had to essentially turn over the soil. 
and they did this using their tusks. They would you know, move their head from side to side and they would churn up the soil using the tusks and this would expose the roots and the tubers of the plants and these were the energy rich parts of the plants so these were obviously the parts they wanted to eat. And then once they'd turned over the soil and they'd exposed the good parts of the plants they could then use their proboscises to of course selectively pick out the stuff they wanted and consume it thereby giving them quite a high energy diet which would be capable of supporting their larger size. Now most elephants develop tusks in the upper jaw only but a few had them in both jaws. One group the uh, uh, dinotheres only had lower tusks. So in terms of other important groups in the order Proboscidea, we have the mastodons. They evolve in Africa and they spread into the northern continents from the Miocene and into the Pleistocene, with one species making it all the way to South America. We do, of course, also have the mammoths, and they diverge from elephants in the late Miocene to Pliocene, and they first make their appearance in North Africa, and then they move into Europe, Asia, and North America, where, of course, they adapt to the colder conditions, and that eventually, of course, gives rise to the woolly mammoth. Now, mammoths actually did pretty well in terms of, you know, how long they managed to live for. So mammoths died out at the end of the last ice age. However, the last continental populations actually managed to persist until about 10,000 years ago, and that was in Siberia in Russia. We even actually had isolated populations that persisted until 3,000, uh, sorry, 3,750 BC on St. Paul's Island in Alaska and 1,650 BC on Wrangell Island in Russia and both of these are in the Bering Sea. So it's quite interesting to think that as human civilizations were beginning to take off there were still mammoths around. So now let's move on to look at the giant aquatic mammals, and in particular the whales. Now we should never forget that the largest animal that's ever lived is alive today, and it is of course the blue whale. So at a maximum length of 30 metres and a maximum weight of 130 tonnes, a blue whale would be capable of giving 99% of dinosaurs a serious inferiority complex. The only modern organism that comes close in terms of its scale are giant trees such as the giant redwood. So the largest giant redwood has a weight of around 2,000 tonnes, but the majority of them weigh about 25 tonnes. So it's quite interesting to think that the only organism that can only come close to a blue whale in terms of scale are the largest of the large trees. Now, of the several types of aquatic or semi-aquatic mammals which we have in the modern world, only the sea cows, that's the order Serentia, and the whales, that's the order Cetacea, are so adapted to the marine environment that they couldn't survive on land. Now, the ancient species from which the whales evolved have been, well, has been identified from Eocene age rocks from Southeast Asia, with Pakistan being the primary location. This dog-sized organism appears to have been closely related to the artilodactyls, that's the even-toed hoofed mammals, and it appears to have been part of a lineage that eventually gave rise to a group of organisms including hippos. So as whale evolution progressed, we can see the following changes. So we can see an increase in body size. We can see the forelimbs becoming more paddle-like. We can see the hind limbs shrinking. We can see the nostrils migrating to the top of the head. And we can see the tail developing a horizontal flute for propulsion. And all of these changes are what you would expect in a shift to the marine environment. So, of course, the forelimbs becoming more paddle-like, well, that's so that the animal can steer more easily in the water. While the hind limb shrinking is to reduce drag. So you don't really need the hind limbs to help you steer. So they're just going to get in the way. So obviously evolution over time is going to get rid of them. And at this current point, they are vestigial. We can also see the nostrils migrating to the top of the head. This, of course, makes a lot of sense. If a whale wants to breathe, it doesn't want to have to stick its whole head out of the water. Instead, all it has to do is just poke its back out of the water and use its blowhole to inhale. And, of course, the development of a horizontal fluke on the tail obviously allows the whale to power itself through the water. Now, whale evolution was relatively rapid and occurred mostly in a 20 million year period in the Eocene. So if we look here in the diagram over on the right, you can see that a lot of the evolution that's taking place begins in the early Eocene and essentially we have the modern day groups of whales by the end of the Eocene. 
So, you know, it's a very, very quick turnaround. Now, in the space of approximately 10 million years, we went from Amblycetus, which is this organism right here, which represents arguably one of the earliest members of the whale lineage, all the way through to Basilosaurus, which is down here. And in terms of Basilosaurus, you can see the forelimbs have been turned into these paddle-like limbs. We can see the hind limbs are now vestigial. We can see the tail has developed a horizontal fluke. And we can quite clearly see a substantial change in body size. Now, Basilosaurus isn't the finished article, though. It still has the same kind of teeth as its ancestors, like Amblycetus. And it also still has its nostrils on its snout. They haven't migrated to the top of the head yet. Now, by the Oligocene, both the current whale groups had evolved. So, of course, we have the Balian whales and the toothed whales. The Balian whales include whales such as the blue whale, while the toothed whales includes groups such as the killer whales and the dolphins. Now, by the Oligocene, both of these groups had evolved. Obviously, we then have the filter feeding Balian whales, and that includes the blue whales and the toothed whales. So that's the killer whales and the dolphins, as I just said. So if we look here, we can see some of these early changes in the whale lineage. So obviously we're starting off with an organism uh, like Amblycetus. So you can see it does have some adaptations to living in the marine environment. So we can see it has webbed feet, obviously, for powering itself through the water. But if you look at the general design, it still looks like it would be more happy on dry land. And to be honest, the same still goes for Rhodocetus as well. You can see that, once again, it has these webbed digits. Uh, you know, it's starting to develop a body shape which is more reminiscent of a whale. However, on the whole, it still looks like it would be more suitable for dry land. Now, eventually we evolve to the point where we have organisms like Juridon. So you can see at this point, the forelimbs have become more paddle-like. The hind limbs are becoming smaller and vestigial. We can see the body's taken on a far more streamlined shape, and we can see the evolution of a horizontal fluke on the tail for propulsion. So by the time we're at Juridon, we can quite clearly see that they've evolved to be an exclusively marine organism. And then from Juridon, we evolved to move forward towards Basilosaurus, and by the time we're at Basilosaurus, you can see the forelimbs have now developed into these solid paddles. We can see that the body mass has increased. We can see we have a big, powerful tail. The hind limbs are now almost completely vestigial. We can still see the nostrils are located on the snout, but they are slowly migrating towards the top of the head. So now let's think about Ice Age mammals. Now, it seems strange that during a period of global cooling, when the environment was becoming more challenging, the trend of mammalian evolution was actually bigger is better. So here's a selection of large mammals that occurred by continent. So in North America, we had animals like the mastodon, the mammoths, the great bison, the giant sloths, the giant camels, and two meter long beavers. In South America, we had giant sloths and griffodonts. In Europe, we had elephants, cave bears, giant deer, which sometimes referred to as the Irish elk, rhinos and mammoths. In Asia, we had elephants, cave bears, giant deer and mammoths. And in Australia, we had three metre tall kangaroos and wombats the size of rhinos. So the question then becomes is, well, why are we seeing this shift towards larger body sizes when you would typically assume evolution should be preferring a smaller body plan? Now, we need to remember that smaller mammals did exist during the last ice age, and they were far more numerous than the large mammals. Now, the question we have to explain is why do we have this pull towards larger body sizes when the cooler conditions should probably have driven a movement towards smaller body designs? Now, what we need to remember is that larger animals have a smaller surface area to volume ratio, and so this means they can actually retain more heat. Another reason for this shift towards larger body sizes may well have been the constant arms race between predator and prey. So as we've already touched on in this presentation, typically the larger you are, the less likely you are to be attacked. Now, if we look at the diagram over here, we can see changes in surface area to volume ratio. So here you can see we have three cubes. We have a, a one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter, a two by two by two, and a three by three by three. Now, if we look at the surface area, we can see as we go from one cube to the other, the surface area increases and the volume increases. But the ratio between them, as you can see, is getting smaller. So here we have a ratio of six to one. Here we have a three to one ratio. Here we have a two to one ratio. 
So what this is showing us is that yes, the surface area is increasing, but the volume is increasing faster. And so this means the volume is getting larger and the surface area isn't quite keeping pace. And this means compared to the volume, the surface area is actually quite small. And obviously the smaller your surface area, the less surface area you have to lose heat. And so having a, having a large body size with a smaller surface area relative to volume can actually work out to be advantageous in terms of not losing heat and thereby preserving your energy reserves. Now, given how recently the rocks and sediments were deposited, there's been relatively little time for Pleistocene deposits to be disturbed. And this means that the fossil record for this epoch is actually pretty good. So the fossil assemblage that we get from Pleistocene deposits differs significantly from the fossil assemblages that we get from other parts of the geologic timescale. Now, typically, most, most fossils that you have will be altered in some way. However, the Pleistocene fossil grouping has a large subset of fossils which are unaltered. And they're unaltered because the animal in question has been frozen in a tundra environment, or it's been protected in tar. Now, this is obviously very, very helpful, because it means not only in some cases do we have the hard body parts, but it also means we have the soft tissues as well. And so this means we have a much greater understanding of some of these animals when we compare them to other fossils where we only have the skeleton. And so this means we can get very good information such as, you know, what was the muscle structure, um, what was the nervous system like, how did they reproduce, what food did they eat, etc. And so this is a level of detail that we normally can't get. And so because of this, we have a pretty decent handle on what life was like during the Pleistocene. So one of the things that we notice in the Cenozoic and especially the Pleistocene is that we have a lot of intercontinental migration. Now, the migration of species between continents accounts for many of the similarities of North American, Asian and European mammalian fauna during the Cenozoic. Now, this was particularly true during the Pleistocene when the Ice Age produced very low sea levels and this allowed land bridges to form between pieces of continent. And the classic example is the Bering Strait. So during these glacial episodes, when we had seawater being locked up in the form of glacial ice, there were global sea level drops and it would have literally allowed you to walk from Russia to Alaska without getting your feet wet. And of course, this allows for a free exchange of animals between Asia and North America. And we can see this exchange of animals because we can see things like horses and camels moving between Asia and North America. In the early Cenozoic, Africa was isolated. However, by the Miocene, it had made contact with Eurasia. And this allowed for sporadic faunal interchange between Africa and Eurasia. And a classic example of that would be the migration of animals such as elephants, mammoths and mastodons from Africa into Europe and Asia. Now, South America was isolated from the end of the Cretaceous until the start of the Pliocene about 5 million years ago. So during this period of isolation, South America developed a unique mammalian fauna consisting of marsupials and several orders of placental mammals. So when the Isthmus of Panama formed, it allowed the migration of species from North America down to South America, and these species very quickly outcompeted the South American mammals in most cases. As a result of this, what's referred to as the Great American Interchange, 50% of South America's mammalian fauna came from the north, while only 20% of North America's mammalian fauna came from the south. So if we just go back to the previous slide, you can see this diagram here. And so we have species that are moving from North America to South America marked here in green, and we have species that are moving from South America to North America marked out here in orange. And you can see that when you look at these green species, with the exception of the mastodon and the saber-toothed cats, all these other species have managed to persist through to the present day. In terms of the fewer species that made it into North America from South America, the ground sloth and the glyphtodont are now extinct, and it's only really the opossum and the armadillo that have actually managed to establish themselves within the North American mammalian fauna. 
Australia has remained isolated throughout the Cenozoic since it separated from Antarctica in the late Cretaceous. Now, this has led to the marsupial population diversifying and becoming dominant over the placental mammalian order. So many placental mammals, so rodents and bats, for instance, were not introduced into Australia until the arrival of colonial explorers and settlers. And so this means rodents and bats are technically considered pests because they're not native species and so they're actively hunted and in order to try and stop the marsupial population being damaged in the same way that South America's marsupial population was Australia has implemented extremely strict laws to protect its fauna. So let's finish this presentation by thinking about Pleistocene extinctions. So during the Pleistocene, the continental interior of North America was stuffed with horses, rhinos, camels, mammoths, mastodons, bison, giant ground sloths, glyphodonts, saber-toothed cats, dire wolves, rodents, rabbits, to name but a few. Now, around 14,000 years ago, many of these animals became extinct, especially the larger ones. Now, unlike previous extinctions, the losses were primarily focused on larger animals, so animals greater than 44 kilograms in weight, and mostly mammals in North America, South America, and Australia. So in Australia, 15 out of the 16 genuses, that's 94% of the large mammals died out. In North America, 33 out of 58 of the large animal genuses died out, so that's 57%. And in South America, 46 of 58 of the large mammal genuses died out, that's 79%. Now, in contrast, Europe only lost 7 out of 23 large mammalian genuses, so that's only 30%. And Africa, south of the Sahara, only lost 2 out of 44 large mammalian genuses. That's only a 5% loss. So you can see that something a bit weird is going on. So there are three questions that have yet to be fully answered. Number one, what caused the Pleistocene extinctions? Number two, why did these extinctions preferentially eliminate large mammals? And number three, why were the extinctions focused on the Americas and Australia in particular? Now, at present, there are two competing explanations. The first one is called the climate change hypothesis, and this proposes that rapid climatic change at the end of the Pleistocene changed habitats driving extinctions. The other possibility is called the prehistoric overkill hypothesis, and this one states that human beings were responsible because mammoth tasted great. Now, the rapid changes in climate and vegetation which occurred as the glaciers retreated during the late Pleistocene is well established. The North American and Northern Eurasian open steppe tundras were replaced with conifers and broadleaf forest as warm, wetter weather conditions became the norm. And so obviously animals which were used to these colder steppe conditions are going to be in trouble. So as the Pleistocene drew to a close, the Arctic region flora changed from a surprisingly productive herbaceous environment, which was capable of supporting numerous animal species, to a waterlogged tundra as the climate became wetter. So essentially what we had during the Ice Age was we had conditions that yes, they were cold, but the plant life that was present was uh, productive enough to support large mammals. As we move towards the end of the Ice Age, we see this productive environment disappearing, being replaced by a waterlogged tundra, which is nowhere near as productive, and so obviously the large mammals can't survive in those conditions anymore. In contrast, the southwestern United States changed from a wet environment with broadleaf trees, grasslands, and numerous lakes and rivers, which was capable of supporting a diverse mammalian fauna, including deer, bison, saber-toothed cats, and mammoths, to a arid to semi-arid environment, which is unable to support a diverse fauna containing large mammals. So once again, environmental changes driving the loss of large mammals in that region. Now, based on these examples, it would seem that the changing climate during the late Pleistocene could have had a serious effect on mammalian populations, but there are also a few problems with the climate change hypothesis. And these problems include 1. Why do the animals simply not migrate as their preferred climate move to higher latitudes? After all, reindeer used to live in France, but as conditions changed, they migrated north into the Arctic. 
Number two, previous glacial advances and retreats did not cause mass extinctions, so why did this one? And number three, Europe had the same climate as North America, so how come Europe wasn't as badly affected as North America when it came to the loss of large mammals? So this brings us on to the other possible cause of the Pleistocene extinction, and this is the prehistoric overkill hypothesis. And this argues that the mass extinctions in North and South America and Australia correlate with the arrival of human beings on those continents. So the hypothesis also suggests that as the fauna of these continents were not familiar with humans, they did not see them as a threat, and as such they were easily killed. In contrast, the animals of Africa and Europe knew humans quite well, they knew we were dangerous, and so they did their best to avoid us, and so the extinctions in these areas were nowhere near as severe. There are two arguments commonly employed against the overkill hypothesis. The first one states that early humans lived in small scattered communities, so how could a few sparsely distributed hunters decimate so many species? Now, the counter-argument to this point is that in the last 600 years, human beings have managed to decimate animal populations all over the world, with the Pacific Islands and New Zealand being particularly good examples. So, of course, in the Pacific Islands, we managed to kill off the dodo very efficiently, and in New Zealand, we managed to kill off several species of flightless moas birds. Now, the counter-argument to the counter-argument states that yes, human beings do have the capacity to absolutely decimate animal populations. However, the human beings that have been doing this during the last 600 years have had access to guns and steel weapons, and these are a luxury that early human beings did not share, and so chances are these early human beings would have been nowhere near as efficient. The other argument against the overkill hypothesis states that hunters will wisely go for smaller, less dangerous animals. So the remains of horses, reindeer and other small animals are found at several prehistoric sites, but mammoth bones and woolly rhinoceros bones are very, very rare, and this would suggest that you know, these animals were not part of the human diet in these communities because we can't see any indication of them having been consumed there. It has also been pointed out that human artefacts are not found among the remains of extinct animals, and large animal bones, so bones for animals like mammoths and rhinos, only show very rare or questionable signs of butchery, and of course once you've killed an animal you're naturally going to butcher it for the meat, and so you would expect to see things like flint marks on the bone which show you that the animal is being butchered, but we don't see those. So the counter-argument is that the impact of human hunting was so swift that the opportunity for substantial numbers of tools at hunting sites to build up is relatively low, and so this means that we were just so efficient that we didn't really have a long enough time period to lose lots and lots of pieces of equipment, and so the indications that human beings were operating in these areas are relatively few and far between. Some have also suggested that early hunters may have preferentially targeted the young of the large mammals and butchered them where they killed them. Now, the smaller skeletons would have been less likely to successfully fossilise, and this may well explain why we don't see indications of butchery on the bones of large mammals. So, the reason for the Pleistocene extinction is uncertain, but the most likely explanation is a hybrid model where populations are already stressed from the effects of climate change, and this makes them more vulnerable to hunting, especially if the females and young are preferentially targeted. And of course, if you are removing the young preferentially, that's eventually going to lead to a population collapse. Okay, everybody, that's it. Thank you very much for watching this presentation, and take care.